Thank you. I'm really glad to have the opportunity to talk about what I've been working on and get your reactions and feedback to it. Um, we pushed the podium out of the way, so I'm hoping that this can have a real conversational tone to it and that you'll kind of treat this like a workshop for me and, um, and talk a lot about how you're reacting and what's working and what's not. So my plan for today is to, um, to mostly spend the bulk of the time talking about what I've been working on here. And this is a little bit tricky because it's the first half of a two-part project. And so it kind of would leave you off if I only talked about that. So then I'm going to kind of introduce where I'm going in the second half. And there it will also be especially useful for me to, to see what questions you would ask and where you would see that going. Um, at the same time, this first part of it is at a phase where I'm getting ready to start writing. I haven't started getting writing yet, so all of the arguments and sections can all be tightened quite a lot at this point. And so finding where there's some logical flaws, where something is clearly wrong or doesn't make sense or would be better in a different order, that would also be really helpful. And then if we, if we have time, then I might talk about the, um, the work that I was doing this spring before coming here, which has some fairly obvious tie-ins to this material. So I'm characterizing this first part that I've been working on as the financial crisis being a test of how the financial world has changed and how legal and regulatory systems may or may not have caught up with those changes. And an overview of where I'm going with this is that we had, policymakers had assumed that securitization, derivative trades based off of those instruments would be protective of risk and would be a stabilizing force in the economy. And because of that belief, among other aspects of their treatment, they were exempted from the bankruptcy code. So all of those trades take place outside of the bankruptcy system. What we saw during the crisis was, I'm going to argue, that that existence outside of the bankruptcy code contributed to some very destabilizing things. Essentially, a run, not a run at a traditional bank, but a run in the securitized banking system. And the result of not being able to use the bankruptcy system, because these instruments were left outside of it, meant that other options that weren't bankruptcy had to be used. And I'm trying to argue here that having an effective bankruptcy law that can resolve all of the instruments that are traded in an economy is an essential backstop to having a stable system and to preventing the kind of solutions that we saw before. Now in my second half that I'm going to forecast, that all is going to move into questions about India because it is starting to embrace the use of financial innovations. It has legalized securitization and legalized derivatives for the first time. And so as it does that, what sorts of systems should it have in place? In fact, it really doesn't have a functioning bankruptcy system. And so is it important? Is it an important backstop to engaging in this sort of risk to have more of a bankruptcy backstop? So this all fits into some surrounding literature. A lot of this is research by Joseph Stiglitz, who you've probably heard of, um, about as India goes from having a state-owned economy closed to international trade and begins to open itself up and, and link itself more with global markets, that's likely to be very destabilizing. Um, there was a thought that opening markets would mean that there was global smoothing of risk. In fact, that doesn't seem to be true, and it seems like having linkages between economies makes for mechanisms for problems to spread. So starting in with this first bit of the research happening here, talking about bankruptcy as an important risk resolution, I realize that I'm speaking to an audience of economists. And so I wanted to start by just talking a little bit more generally about bankruptcy law and getting at some of the themes that will inform some of this work. So I'm going to be a company, and I'm going to make myself a law firm. 
and I'm a law firm that isn't doing so well. I am, I'm sort of teetering, teetering on the brink. And I realize that, and the company directors want to keep their jobs. They're taking on additional credit in hopes that maybe the company will be saved. And one of the things that this law firm has done is that it's taken on a really big loan in order to revamp its whole AV system, thinking that that'll really attract clients and be a good thing to do. So to get all of that money to do that, it's a lot of money, it's had to go to banks. I've negotiated with a bank, I'll have Rustin be our bank representative here. And um, Rustin knows what he's doing. He's been giving bank loans for a long time. He's looking at all of my statements. He's seeing that there's actually quite a lot of risk because I'm having problems at a law firm. And so he's in a really good bargaining position. He's got the money, he's got the knowledge, he's got the experience, and he's probably gonna drive a pretty hard bargain on this loan. He's probably going to set the interest rate quite high to account for the big risk of lending to this law firm that's not doing very well. And he's also, because he can, because I still need to borrow from him, he's also probably going to secure that loan, which means that he's gonna take a property interest in some of my other assets as a protective thing in case I go bankrupt. He will have some property rights to those assets. And I'm probably gonna give that to him because there's no other way to get that money. Now, I also have employees as a law firm. So Sam is one of my employees. Sam is not Sam. He's a low-level employee, which he would never be in real life. Um, <laughs> he's, he's doing some administrative clerical stuff for us. The economy's not so great. It's been hard to find a job. He's glad to have this job. When he took the job, and now when he's had the job, he really doesn't know about my financials. Unlike Rustin, he is not asked to look through my financial books. He's taken the job. I've offered him a salary. He may have tried to negotiate it. I am in the power position here. The salary is what it is. It's probably not going to reflect in any way my risk of going bankrupt as a law firm. And as that risk increases, you're not really gonna be able to go into a partner's office and say, I need a higher salary because you might go bankrupt and I need to protect myself. You're in a bad position that's very different from the bank's position. Then we've got some suppliers giving us things. So we'll make Nicole our paper supplier. And she's in a slightly different position yet from Rustin and from Sam. She gives us paper every month. We pay her at the end of the month. So it's August 7th now. We've had a good week of paper that has actually technically been on credit. And in fact, Sam's salary is in the same situation. He's been working for this first seven days of August and he won't get paid till the end of the month. So our paper supplier here is kind of our midpoint because the paper supplier isn't completely unknowledgeable. She's been supplying paper to different law firms for a long time. She hasn't exactly visited our books and set the interest rates to reflect the exact risk of this law firm, but she's been in the market. She knows that she certainly needs to try to charge an interest rate that will be protective of her interests should this law firm that she's providing paper to every month on credit and fall into bankruptcy. She also, unlike the employee he, who only has one job, she might be supplying paper to lots of different law firms. So if she's out my seven days of payment, she's got the other firms. It's not such a bad thing. But of course she wants us to do well and survive because she wants our continued business. Our employee wants us to do well and survive because he wants our continued business. And our bank wants us to do pretty well too because he wants to get his loan all paid back. The last thing I've put here on this slide is um, there's just some creditors that you don't tend to think of, including the US government who's owed taxes 
Um, you also become creditors in ways that you don't realize. When you buy an airplane ticket, you're a creditor of that airline until you take the flight because you have paid for it and they are still owing you the service until you take the flight. So here's where we start linking into economics. Does anyone know about the economic theory related to the tragedy of the commons? You want it? Uh, anytime you have property that's commonly owned, uh, anything you do <clears throat> to protect it or improve it, or any way in which you resist from hurting it in a way that benefits you personally, you can't fully, you, you don't receive the full benefit of that work. Nothing. And therefore, there's a tendency for commonly held property to uh, become dilapidated or unprotected. That's exactly right. I mean, the qualities of a resource can set up a series of incentives that lead to bad things. So the idea is that you have a common pool resource. Um, a typical example that's used is a fishery because the fishery only has a certain number of fish there in the water. And once you've fished them, they have all been fished and there's gone. So it's a collectively managed resource and the fish in it are scarce. There's not an unlimited supply, which sets up this conflicting set of incentives where um, Ethan, if he's fishing, <laughs> um, he wants to fish as many fish as he possibly can because he'll get all of those fish for himself. But it's better for all of us in the room if he doesn't do that. It's better for all of us in the room to get together and to set up rules and to create limits on how many fish are fish so that we can preserve that resource into the future. But left on its own, we think that without any sort of centralizing system that brings us together and forces us to make those sacrifices, individuals will behave like Ethan, they will fish all of the fish, and the resource will be destroyed. Now that applies directly to a bankrupt company. A bankrupt company doesn't have enough assets to pay back all of its creditors. So we have scarce resources. And once we pay out that money, it's gone and it's not available to another creditor. So we've got the same what's called common pool resource where lots of people want it and they can't all have it. And we have the same set of conflicting incentives setting up. Because if I can gather you four back here again, our paper supplier, our employee, our banker, and I think that's it, we'll leave the government out. And when you see me, my law firm, running into problems, if you can do anything at all, what would you want to do? Take all your money before everyone else does. Exactly. The theory behind bankruptcy is that there will be basically a race of creditors, that you will all come running towards me and claim the assets that are there. Because if you get there first, there are going to be assets there for you, and the person who gets there last is going to go away with nothing. So same incentives. One person wants to rush and take all of the assets for themselves, when in fact, it would be better for all of us in the room if we instead made some negotiations and compromises, decided who got what. In an ideal state, we could keep the company in business and it could continue to employ Sam and continue to buy paper and pay back its loans. So these are the goals of the bankruptcy law, is to prevent this tragedy that will occur if one creditor runs and wins the race and takes all of the assets, and I'm giving assets away in a very piecemeal, disorderly way, and probably the whole company is going to unravel. So we overlay bankruptcy law onto that, and we say, instead of this race, we're going to have a very orderly collective process and instead of this piecemeal distribution, we're going to have very clear rules about who gets what, and they're going to be much more fair than having the person who gets there first get everything, and the person who gets there last gets nothing. And we're gonna say that everything has to happen at once. We're going to collectivize what happens. And this is the originator of that theory, who is now at a business school. 
So if we add on top of that kind of basic, basic understanding of what bankruptcy law is going to do, there are certain qualities that most legal systems agree are good qualities of a bankruptcy system. And so we use these metrics to evaluate them. Now we want a bankruptcy law that's efficient, we want a bankruptcy law that's fair, and we want a bankruptcy law that is transparent. And you will see in our bankruptcy code provisions all over the place that are going towards those goals. So on the efficiency front, the idea again is that we have this collective process. As soon as bankruptcy starts, a moratorium is put in place. And that stays any kind of enforcement action that any of our creditors might have for my assets. So instead of them individually trying to enforce their claims against me, we stay all of that, we move into the collective system, we deal with everything all at once. And the animating idea behind all of this is that the more assets that we can distribute back to creditors, the better that everyone does, then we'll have overall less risk in lending. And that will make credit more cheap in our economy. Because if Rustin is evaluating the situation and thinks, well, she might go bankrupt, but I'm trusting that the process will enable me to get back most of what I've lent, then he'll charge a lower interest rate. And that'll make it easier for other entrepreneurs, people starting business to get access to capital. And we think that that's good for the economy. So a major quality of bankruptcy is the idea that it should be efficient. In fact, there is a raging debate about whether it should be just efficient as between the company and the creditors, or whether it should be efficient in a more broad sense and should be taking into account the interests of other people in the community, other businesses, et cetera. And while the debate range, rages, there's in fact many normative goals that go beyond just efficiency for creditors embedded in how our bankruptcy law operates. Among those, this norm that we will rehabilitate a company and we will keep it going if we can for the employment and the community suppliers. Now the second thing is, is fairness. And so rather than our race where we had everyone coming for the assets, Bankruptcy deals with creditors not individually, but deals with them at the class level. So we've got our banker. I've probably got some loans from other bankers that are in the same kind of power position as Rustin is. They have also likely secured their loans. Sam is not our only employee. We've got a whole group of employees who are owed their wages. Nicole is not our only supplier. We've got all sorts of suppliers that we haven't paid for the seven days of the month. So they all become classes of creditors with equal rights. And when the bankruptcy process comes in and gets all of the assets together and begins to distribute them, there is fairness within classes, first of all. So you will receive back the exact amount of money per dollar owed to you as all of the other creditors in your same situation. So all of the employees, no matter how much money you're owed, you'll say get 50 cents of every dollar that you're owed. And we think that's fair. Moving between classes, we have an established hierarchy of how people receive their assets. And you can see why the security was an important thing for this banker to do, because secured creditors take first priority in distribution. And you can see that the law pays a certain attention to the problems of employees that we discussed surrounding Sam, that he can't diversify, he can't control interest rates, he can't really negotiate. And so employees rank above the general mass of unsecured creditors in this distribution. Yeah. You said that one of the benefits of this system is that credit becomes cheaper because creditors are less worried about these uh, risks. Um, are employee, is labor cheaper as well because employees are less worried about uh, 
not ultimately receiving their paychecks. Well, I mean, you can play that out. I mean, it again gets into the power of the negotiation in a way. I mean, are you paying employees and are they only willing to take the job? You know, the employees, let me start that over. I mean, the, the test on that might be a European system where in a bankruptcy there are far greater rights for an employee to continue in its employment. Does that make the wages cheaper? I don't think so. I think if anything, it's not having that kind of effect at all and possibly the opposite because the, the desires are different and the alternatives are different. So do you, do you think this, the including employee wage claims in here could be more of a normative thing than an efficiency, just an efficiency? Or a fairness thing. Yeah. I was always thinking, if I were a firm and I was trying to get rid of all of my debts, so I just filed for Chapter 11 for bankruptcy. So do you think it's a possible way for me to get rid of my debts? Because now I'm, I went bankrupt. I, you, as my creditor, you get all the assets. But for most of, uh, most of time, assets is not enough for all of my debts. So now I went bankrupt, so what else I can do? Well, this is what's happening in this system. I mean, creditors are getting distributions that are determined by their ranking in this priority. But the ideal goal, because of this rehabilitation norm, and because of the fact that really it's better for creditors often, there are cases where this isn't the efficient answer, but in many cases, there's a viable, economically viable business. Mm -hmm. There, it's just that there have been some bad choices, some bad management, and so the idea generally is to keep this company in business and mm -hmm. enable it to have a fresh start and get back on its feet. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a key distinction in all of this. So a company can be insolvent. It then has to actively file for bankruptcy and though it's insolvent, it might still have an economically viable mm -hmm. business there. Okay, and so the final thing I wanna say here about fairness is that there are, uh, we've talked about the automatic stay that was preventing anyone from enforcing and helping with efficiency. If Rustin again was sophisticated enough in his loan and had the tools to monitor the law firm's economic situation as we think that he might. He might notice that things are getting worse at the law firm. And he might then do some things to help himself. He might say, ask for some more security to reflect that risk. In fact, the law then will look at the transactions that I made in the 90 days before filing for bankruptcy and that money that I gave him 90 days before bankruptcy will have to get returned to the estate. Mm -hmm. So there can't be a favoring of a particular creditor in advance of bankruptcy. All creditors have to receive in this process. We also have the courts reviewing the fairness and with some powers to go in and just change outcomes if what's being reached is not a fair outcome. Finally, transparency. Um, Bankruptcy is often described as a fishbowl. It's taking place in open court. There are disclosure requirements on the creditor side so that the company will know who it's negotiating with. There are also disclosure requirements on the company side so that it becomes very public what assets and what liabilities the company has. A lot of the procedures of bankruptcy have that kind of public, transparent quality to them. When you file for bankruptcy, that's a public filing. You then attach a schedule of the company's assets and liabilities. If the company needs more financing to support itself while it goes through this process, there's an application for financing that gets ruled on in court. All of this is going on transparently. We have creditors voting on the ultimate plan, and all of that is becoming a public record. We also have various structures and entities in place ensuring the integrity of this process. The court can appoint an independent examiner to look into any aspect of what's going on and write a public report on it. 
there's an arm of the Department of Justice, the Office of the U.S. Trustee, whose job is to monitor and look for corruption and problems in U.S. bankruptcy cases. So this is all to get us to the fact that that all sounded great, although there are some problems there that we're glossing over. But instead of that, instead, we got a bailout. And I'm not making a normative judgment on this bailout. I'm not saying that that wasn't the right thing to do at the time. It saved the system. But what I am saying is that it might have been better to be able to have used bankruptcy because this bailout was not particularly efficient and it wasn't particularly fair and it also wasn't particularly transparent. And you can see that the lack of those qualities did cause some problems in what happened. I mean, what was going on was not this orderly collective process that we've described. It was an emergency situation. It was the government reacting in an ex post manner to events as they were happening on the ground, which caused a lot of uncertainty because most creditors can become familiar with the bankruptcy process, can have an idea of what lies in store for them. It's not so scary. This, on the other hand, was very uncertain. The decisions that were being made were not those same efficient decisions about maximizing the recoveries of creditors. Instead, there were closed door deals with the one buyer who was willing to buy the company. The idea was to solve the problem. Um, and this is often critiqued as creating a sort of a moral hazard because companies were shielded from the risk that they took and the question is, does this bailout, does that then lead to excessive risk taking in the future? We can also describe what went on as, as less fair than what we've talked about in the bankruptcy process. Um, in the bankruptcy process that we've talked about, the creditors that are part of the negotiation are agreeing to take losses on what's owed to them. Here, the losses on what were owed were largely imposed on taxpayers. Different things were done for different companies, sometimes as political statements. So there was a lot of uncertainty generated and also a certain public anger at what it was seeing that didn't look fair. And an example of that is an outcry when bailout money to AIG was being sent to creditors in Europe that didn't seem fair to the general public. There's also the fact that the bailout is essentially deciding to subsidize particular institutions in the economy, which we might also deem less fair. Also, this was not going on in open court in the same way that we discussed about the bankruptcy fishbowl. Um, there was no court oversight at all. Instead, we had government acting in ways that it had never acted before without precedence and without clear guidelines. There was a lot of secrecy seemingly in some of these transactions. And for example, there's news stories that talk about how right after the FDIC increased the amounts of deposits that were insured, there was still a bank run the next day because nobody understood what that increase in deposit insurance meant. There was a lot of confusion that seems qualitatively different from paying attention to a very set court process with a lot of precedence. So why was bankruptcy not used? Because bankruptcy, I'm hoping, is sounding better than that. What, what was the problem? The thing about bankruptcy is that when my law firm goes bankrupt, we're getting back in the assets and we're distributing those assets that are part of my bankruptcy estate to the creditors. So if there were payments made 90 days before bankruptcy, the avoidance powers bring those back in. But that's what we're working with, those assets in the bankruptcy estate. Securitized instruments and derivatives have been exempted. Those assets related to those trades do not count as property of the bankrupt estate. And what I'm going to try to argue for you, and you'll be hearing a lot more about, is I'm saying that without those assets, 
being part of a prospective bankruptcy estate and then an actual bankruptcy estate, that's going to cause behaviors that both make bankruptcy more likely and it's also going to then leave in its wake a situation where you can't use bankruptcy. So starting with these exemptions and securitization as the first one. So the point of using a securitization structure is largely to create a set of assets that are, quote, bankruptcy remote. So if we set out this schema, um, maybe we should call back in our same employees here. So if I am a bank now, <laughs> rather than a law firm, and I am owed payments on mortgages that I've lent money to, I am then going to transfer those future payment streams over to Rustin, who is now a special purpose vehicle and not a bank. So those payments in the future are being moved out of my bank and over to him. And then he is going to sell them on to other investors. So Sam is going to buy some of them. So the idea of this is that you have this separate SPV that is a different entity from me, the bank. The SPV has ownership of those assets. So if I go bankrupt, those assets have nothing to do with me anymore. I have sold them on to the SPV. And that's kind of great for a lot of people that are involved in this transaction. Sam, when he buys his securitized assets from Rustin, he doesn't have to look into my whole situation as a bank. He doesn't have to investigate my financial records because it doesn't matter to him if I go bankrupt. That's going to have nothing to do with whether he's made a good investment on buying those loans. Jerry, could you just put some common names, proper names on these, on you, Rustin, and Sam for us? Like, are you Lehman Brothers? Are you? Um, just so that we, uh, are you the corner bank? Ah, um, let's make me Lehman Brothers. Okay, just... And you're my special purpose vehicle, Such as... which there were many of. There are long articles written about the Dante special pur purpose vehicle, so you can be that. It could be me, in fact. <clears throat> I could just have established this thing separate from me, but it's functionally still part of me. But I'm doing this so because of the legalistics. Like you're, like inside the building, you can be down the hall? Mm-hmm. Okay, good. And now, when he's got all of these loans in him, he can then start mixing them together and slicing them up before selling them on. That's the CDO portion of this, the collateralized debt organization, so that then Sam as an investor can buy exactly what he wants and have exactly the risk that he wants to buy. Yes? Can you remind me about the history? Lehman went bankrupt, right? So did not, go, did, did not get bailed out, right? It's going to be one of my case studies. So let. So, so that's so all the security issues work just fine in, in that uh, situation, right? Well, let's get there. <laughs> the point right now is just that the securitization process is taking a lot of assets out of the bankruptcy estate. It's making them, quote, bankruptcy remote. Derivatives, yes. Uh, so when you transferred the loans to me, the special purpose vehicle, did I have to give you money in exchange for that? Yes. So, so the money would be, uh, was not exempt in it? The bankruptcy. Except that it's very likely that that money I then use to make more mortgage loans. So I'm going to spend it and send it right back on to you. I'm going to give more money. Yeah, then you, I give you more money. So we're going in a cycle. And that all sounds good until the value of what I've sold starts to change. Mm -hmm. Because you're giving me money on the basis that those loans will be repaid. And once they're not, this whole system falls apart. 
So it sounds like securitization is not protective against financial instability. It's the opposite. That's part of the point, exactly. And I think this will all become more clear once we get into the case studies and we're not talking about it in an abstract way. But yes, that's the thing. It seemed like this would be a stabilizing thing that I am taking essentially the risk of those loans and putting them somewhere else. The risk. So it's like I buy the loan from you and then you give me some money. It's like I'm your insurance provider. So you pay for the insurance. But the reality is at the end, everyone is connected. Just one of us goes wrong, you know, goes bankrupt. So everyone is involved. Exactly. And there's a certain kind of adding fuel to this loop that's going on with getting the money back, not worrying about whether the loans get paid back or not, that I'm going to talk about some more in a little bit. So derivatives. These same securitized mortgages that we've just sold to Sam, we can start doing some even more complicated things with them. We can construct derivative trades from doing some things with them. And derivatives have been explicitly exempted from the bankruptcy code. And it's an exemption that's gotten bigger and bigger over time. And it's largely a result of a lobby, it seems, except that there was a reasoning there also that it would be more stabilizing to exempt these trades from the bankruptcy code. So just to cover what we're talking about, um, we've got swaps. So let's see. So we have me, again, as Lehman Brothers. I'm holding on to a big pile of mortgage-backed securities, too, because I've invested in some of them. And now I'm going to get for myself a third party, Nicole. And I'm going to trade with her that if the mortgage-backed security does not get paid, if the underlying loan is defaulted on and I don't get paid, then she is responsible for that loss. So I feel like I've really got no risk here. I bought the mortgage-backed security, but it's Nicole who's holding the risk for it. So we've entered into a swap. And this might be a swap that she has collateralized, which means that in our contract of our agreement, if, say, my rating from Moody's goes down, she might get to have more collateral or she might be able to just demand more collateral if she sees that I have more risk. There are going to be ways, likely, that she will be able to make a collateral call for some of my assets as a protective measure. Well, what does she swap? So she's essentially insuring this mortgage-backed security. She's saying that if she's Can making a, a And she's making a bet that it's all going to work out OK, the mortgage is going to be great, the mortgage-backed security will be worth what we think. But she's taken on the risk of it. She's in um, another form of derivative is the um, repo trade, which became a way for banks to get access to short-term liquidity. So a way for a bank to get money was to say, here I've got these mortgage-backed securities. And now, Ted, I'm going to give some of those to you. And you're going to give me some money now for them. But you know, don't worry about it, because at a certain time, I'm going to buy them back from you. So we're just doing this little switch that will give me some money up front based on the perceived value of these mortgage-backed securities that we've hold. If I go bankrupt, though, all of these people have recourse to assets outside of going through our collective fishbowl bankruptcy process. And we're going to talk about what that means. So all of the elements of the bankruptcy code that we've talked about, that stay on running, the ability to get back the money that left 90 days up to the bankruptcy, all of that doesn't apply for these swap payments. And what I'm going to try to argue for you is that makes a coordinated resolution that is orderly, efficient, and fair not a possibility. So 
just to hit this one more time. Without the automatic stay, you can all come running. Without the preference liability, you can start taking assets out of the bank in the lead up to its bankruptcy. This ipso facto clause is generally immediately abolished upon insolvency, but because you're not part of the bankruptcy system, you can have in your contract with me an ipso facto clause that says that if I go bankrupt, then you can immediately just claim back everything that you have a right to. And then this netting is a little bit more complicated and not so relevant, but it means that if we have a lot of trades going, Rustin and I, and some he owes me on and some I owe him on, he, unlike other creditors who bankruptcy law does not let do this, he can add and subtract all of those and get to a smaller amount that he's owed by me. So his exposure to my failure becomes much less. Other creditors aren't allowed to do that. So I'm probably going to repeat this a few times, I'm realizing, but so this is setting up a series of incentives, I'm arguing. So I'm my bank and the value of these mortgage-backed securities is falling. I'm not doing so well. My swap counterparty is going to say, you're looking risky, your ratings, rating might have just gone down, I need some more collateral. And often these were collateralized with more mortgage-backed securities. So I would then need to sell mortgage-backed securities in the market to come up with the collateral to give to her. But since I'm selling a lot of these at once, their price is falling. And that means that other banks that are holding them are suddenly holding things that are worth less as well. So this is not good. Now, ordinarily, this would be a really good time to declare bankruptcy because it would stop, you would think, these calls for assets from me and we could all get together and have this court process and we could come up with some solutions and come up with a way to um, reorganize the bank and keep it on its feet and employing its people and its suppliers. But all of these Nicole swap counterparties, they have no incentive to start coming into a process and making compromises. There's no reason for them to do that so they just keep calling for collateral, which makes this whole process get worse. And by the time so much collateral has come out, there aren't even enough assets left in my bank to even go through a successful reorganizing. That point was back in the orange box before the red one. Yeah. So the thing that you mentioned a while ago about uh, the period leading up to 90 days before bankruptcy, the money, money that exchanged hands during that time being sent back doesn't apply to any derivatives? No, so we can have this huge rush on the eve of bankruptcy of collateral getting demanded and coming out of the company. This is going to come up again. So I'm trying to make an argument here that I don't want to make too strongly. I'm not saying that the bankruptcy exemption was the only reason that these products took off, but I think it's logical to say that they contributed to the popularity of these instruments. So I was just going to go through some numbers showing just the huge growth in these types of instruments. Um, you see securitization becoming a quarter of the US bond market. Here it is visually. Here are the CDOs. Um, banks are heavily involved with this, holding a lot of them in really remarkable numbers. And not just US banks, incidentally. If you look at the data on this, Chinese banks are holding a lot, et cetera. And here is the derivatives market growing extremely quickly from its inception. If we disaggregate that into swaps and repos that we've been talking about, both of them are growing at quite a rate. Here's that visually. And we have a discussion, this is a professor at Vanderbilt Law School, talking about the fact that a lot of these trades are going on between banks, that it's not as if risk is being sent out to the broader financial system. A lot of it is being concentrated in just a few banks. 
And then here are the, the repos, which were often between banks. So again, I don't want to hit this too hard. There are, there are other reasons for the tremendous growth in these instruments. But you can see how the bankruptcy exemption and remoteness are encouraging of their use. I mean, the securitization route, because this is existing outside of bankruptcy, that means you don't have to price in the risk of bankruptcy. So it's a cheap form of financing without that risk put in. Now, firms that are high risk, if they move all that money into the SPV, then the investor in the product cares not at all about any risks related to the original company. So companies like that can now raise money. Because I, as the bank again, have passed on the right to the future payment streams, I'm not so concerned, and I can start issuing mortgages to riskier and riskier home buyers because I've sent everything that happens with that mortgage downstream to other entities. And this tranching process can start to create products that fit exactly with the risk tolerance of an investor. Yes? So I thought the tranching did exactly the opposite. Because I thought that the tranching meant that everything was considered the same. Because, and so that it didn't work it to individual investors with different risk tolerances. It assumed that the risk riskiness of the assets was all the same because the high risk ones are getting thrown in with the lowest ones. So I'm not sure. I see your point. It's both things, I think. It's that there are institutions that can't, the way their investment rules are, invest in a product below a certain rating. So this can be made to fit what they can invest in right. and whether this was done accurately or not but so they can be made to be desirable to investors, whether through alchemy or... Seems, seems like it shifts the risk, depending on how they do it. Um, and then I, as the bank, am getting fees on both sides. I'm getting them for extending the mortgage. I'm getting it for securitizing the mortgage. I can then use those fees for more lending. Um, so on derivatives, um, you know, if Nicole is entering a swap with me, she knows that my bankruptcy does not matter. She'll be able to make her collateral calls. So she doesn't really care who she's doing the trade with. This seems like a good thing to start buying. Um, she doesn't have to monitor how I'm doing. It has the appearance of being a very low risk transaction. So this is hitting this again, my, um, my arrow waterfall. So trading in these products seems very individually rational, but it's setting off that waterfall that as mortgage default becomes more likely because banks are lending in increasingly risky ways, you have counterparties beginning to call for collateral which then makes me sell off assets to meet the collateral calls, which decreases the value of those assets, which is bad for other institutions, and it's bad for me. And eventually, if I were to go bankrupt, they would be outside of the process. They would call in all of the rest of their collateral. I would be left with very little to go through a bankruptcy with. Ah, so I've done that already. <laughs> so I think this makes more sense when we put it into these case studies. So if we start with Bear Stearns, so it's holding a huge number of these repos. That's been a cheap way for the bank to get money to, you know, to pass those securities on to a third party, get the money up front on the promise that they'll be bought back later. Suddenly, these mortgage-backed securities are not worth as much. Bear Stearns is exposed to them, and the market realizes that's not good. So the counterparties on those repos begin to call for collateral. And regulators see those calls happening, 
They see the price of the securities being driven down lower and lower. They know that bankruptcy won't end those calls because the counterparties aren't affected by it. And so they rush to do something to stop those calls and stop the cycle that's spiraling. Next, we have AIG, and these are all very similar, really. So AIG is involved in a lot of these swaps based on the securities. It's also holding a lot of them in its own portfolio. So as the value of these securities fall, AIG is having to post more collateral to its counterparties. It also has direct losses. There's a downgrade and that downgrade triggers more collateral calls. More collateral calls, we're stuck in the same cycle, regulators see that bankruptcy won't stop the collateral calls and turn to doing something that will. Lehman Brothers is, as you've said, it's a little different because it was put into bankruptcy. It had a huge number of derivatives transactions. It was in a similar situation where the mortgage-backed securities were causing counterparties to make calls for collateral. It was put in bankruptcy. 700,000 derivative contracts terminated at once. That's been estimated to have a $50 billion cost. I can't really tell how that number is arrived at. But there were some things that were lucky in the case of Lehman. Um, it happened that a lot of those Swap contracts weren't written in a way that there was as much collateral that could be called. Some of them weren't very well collateralized, it seems. There was also a lot of creative lawyering. So it seems that these individual derivative transactions were each argued in court, and there were some boundaries placed on what counted as something that could go to collateral, so that you had these situations in which the court decided that if the collateral had been commingled with the general accounts, then that would stay in the bankruptcy estate. So it seems like there was a definite intention of trying to limit the loss of bankruptcy assets. I mean, whether this bankruptcy was successful or not is something we could certainly debate. I mean. It was more public. There is a court record. The litigation continues now. Um, would it have been better had there not been the derivatives exemption in place in the bankruptcy law is the real question, I think. So these next are you? Oh, yes. Some of the stuff got uh, sold in almost immediately, right? As as they did, and so that didn't go through the court system at all, right? Well. Actually, I don't think I'm going to get there, but this was what I had put into the talk as if there weren't that many questions, I was going to talk about this trend in US bankruptcy of Section 363 asset sales. And Lehman Brothers was a Section 363 asset sale, which is a provision of the bankruptcy code that enables assets to be sold off quickly. And um, so it's a slightly different process than the traditional Chapter 11, although that's a provision of Chapter 11. But it's not that there's no court involvement. I mean, there's court approval at the end. There are some disclosures about the bids for the sale. So it's, it's not entirely outside the remit of the bankruptcy court, although it is more so than a traditional procedure. And that allowed, yes, the sale to be approved in one day, I believe. OK, so now we're getting to the last bit of this work that I've been working on here at the Institute. And these arguments, I think, are probably going to fold in on each other and, and get more streamlined. But what I'm saying is that as the dust settles and as what happened in the crisis begins to be analyzed, there is a new appreciation of the importance of bankruptcy. And a lot of the solutions that are being put in place depend on an effective bankruptcy law and interact with an effective bankruptcy law so that having a bankruptcy law is important. This is a um, former head of the FDIC testifying in the wake of the crisis and in what she's calling for as a solution going forward. 
She doesn't use the word bankruptcy, but it sounds a lot like bankruptcy. She's talking about transparency, clear structure of who gets paid what, etc. So here is what I'm calling a return to bankruptcy values and this appreciation that we have a bankruptcy code and it's been tested and we have a body of case law, we have professors writing articles, we have commentary, we have this huge system that's already there. Why start from scratch? This is efficient, it's fair, it's transparent, it has good things in it, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's also a vibrant debate about getting rid of these exemptions that I've talked about, and particularly the safe harbors for the derivative trades. So here is the same Thomas Jackson that we saw at the beginning talking about common pool theory and the tragedy of the commons. Here he is actively engaged in congressional hearings talking about getting rid of that exemption along with others who agree with him. So proposals are coming out of all sorts of different bodies, testimony before the American Bankruptcy Institute. The current head of the FDIC has talked about reversing the exemption as a good idea. And it seems that these assets have been so singled out, whereas back when we had the law firm and we had Rustin as the bank being the secured creditor, he had property rights in his security and the bankruptcy code dealt with those. It kind of balanced his right to that property with the idea of keeping those assets in the company to begin with to support the restructuring. So the automatic stay applied to him as a secured creditor. He had the highest priority of getting paid back. There are some other rights there in the code about things that can and cannot happen to secured creditors. So we have a way of privileging a set of creditors without taking them entirely out of the system entirely. Also arguing about the fact that what is happening is happening kind of with, with the bones of bankruptcy in it. It's not an entirely separate fix. It is complementing the Chapter 11 that already exists. So that the Dodd-Frank Act created the Orderly Liquidation Authority and Title I of it says that every institution has to file a living will. But the language there of what the living will has to show is that it has to show that there's a viable plan for using Chapter 11 to liquidate the company. So the baseline here is still Chapter 11. So it's important that we have a good Chapter 11. Title II then says, if this institution is in trouble, we're gonna try to use chapter 11. The only time we won't use chapter 11 is if we have fears that that will have bad systemic consequences. So again, chapter 11 as the baseline here, and this idea that doing something else will cause a moral hazard, and we don't wanna do that if we don't have to. Interestingly, yeah and uh, the Fed are not satisfied by the living will submitted by the major banks. Do you know what's on their report? They said the report is like 70, 80 page, pay, uh, pages, but they request them to resubmit the living will. So do you know what's the problem about the current, the current living will they have submitted? Well, they're available publicly online. <laughs> and, um, but essentially, this, they're not according with this language of Title I that they don't seem like they will demonstrate an orderly plan for resolution that's convincing enough. I think part of it, just reading the reports, the news reports, a piece of it has to do with the complexity of the organizational complexity of the banks. Mm -hmm. So when they did these special vehicle institutions and they were still on the ownership structure is so complicated it sounded like and this is just like reading between the lines that they couldn't unravel them in bankruptcy like uh, process so that they so they still be so was the complexity of the 
organizational structures that made it impossible to unwind orderly, which is why they can meet the living will standards in the lives. Is my understanding of the And in a way, I'm gonna, in a few slides from now, there are some proposals that some of them say that all of OLA, the order to, orderly liquidation authority should be scrapped. And part of it is that between the complexity and between the fact that chapter 11 still exempts these things at this point, you're never gonna be able to use chapter 11 anyway. So why are you talking about all of this chapter 11? We just need to focus on making what you do instead good or improving chapter 11 instead. But interestingly, what this orderly liquidation authority way does is that it imposes a stay on these collateral calls. It's not entirely getting rid of the exemption, but it's putting a one day hold on the operation of the exemption with the idea that in that one day, before this whole bank is dismantled, replying to the collateral calls, it can be kept together and dealt with together and then after one day, we've got it all set already. So there are these proposals floating around. The top one seems to be coming from the right. It's a paper out of the Hoover Institution. And these people have testified before Congress. The idea is what I essentially already said, that really chapter 11 is not functional. It has this safe harbor. You're always going to be using the OLA. We should get rid of this. We should focus on the bankruptcy. OLA is about liquidating. We might want to just reorganize and keep the bank alive. You can see how that fits in with the political agenda that you, you don't want to be killing off these banks. Um, also coming from the left seems to be the bottom proposal. And the hearings on it have just been taking place in July and are available online. And this is saying, well, no, we don't need to be quite that radical. We don't need to make this whole new chapter of the Bankruptcy Code, Chapter 14. We'll just put in a new subchapter in the existing Chapter 11. So we'll show that we really want Chapter 11. This is just in the rare case when it's not gonna work, but we're coordinating with Chapter 11. And we don't need to get rid of the whole new orderly liquidation authority we should just have a lot of options. We should have a very go good, strong, robust Chapter 11. We should also have this Title II of the OLA out there as a backstop, which is, I think, essentially a recognition of these are hard problems when you have a complicated bank that runs into trouble. Now, you want as many tools as you possibly can. You want to have as flexible of a response ready as you can. And so having a strong and robust Bankruptcy law is an important tool in that toolbox. So if I summarize what I've done so far, this research that I'm doing here, I'm trying to say that a functional bankruptcy law is very essential to the stability of an economy. The US bankruptcy now ha law has now become somewhat misaligned with the developments that have happened in financial markets, the rise of these instruments. It's pretty easy to fix that. And we are fixing it with new resolution tools that are operating alongside or with or on the basis of our existing bankruptcy law, which we are lucky to have. As I get into the second phase, which I have not been working on yet, but I tried to create some slides so that I could just talk about where I think I'm going with it. You have interesting things happening in India with the liberalization of the state-owned economy in 1991, opening the country to trade, um, lots of changes in the marketplace, a very deliberate attempt to create a deep debt market, especially in reaction to seeing the Asian financial crisis, an idea that a deeper debt market would be a good thing, and that to the extent that securitizing assets and allowing for derivatives allows for more liquidity in the secondary debt market, that that would be a good thing. So there's been this explicit legislative work to make these sorts of trades possible. You have high-level summits about how to increase 
the debt market and the secondary debt market especially, and it seems to be happening. The debt market is, is growing steadily. And the National Housing Bank has been particularly supportive of the idea of securitizing mortgages. And this makes sense. There is acute housing needs in India. Um, the number of population living outside of a house is very high. And the credit for buying a house is extremely expensive. And I think that a lot of that risk is because there aren't any alternatives to bank lending. It's very high risk for the bank to make that loan because of the lack of bankruptcy law and the lack of the ability of the bank to enforce that loan. And also the fact that most of the bank deposits that are funding that loan are quite short term as compared to the situation on a US bank balance sheet. But this is the thing, the bankruptcy law is described a lot as dysfunctional. India ranks 128th in the doing business report about the ease of completing a bankruptcy. There are very few options for procedures. There is this first liquidation act that's just from colonial days. It's a carbon copy of what was on the books in English law at the time, which has been reformed considerably in England. The more recent legislation applies only to sick companies, which are defined as manufacturing firms, firms with factories. And then there's this attempt to bring over from England the scheme of arrangement, which is just an informal workout among creditors. So bankruptcy cases have an average of about 12 years in India, but there are many that have gone on for 50 and 50 plus years. And some of that is a particular policy preference, it seems, of the judicial system in India. There are statements in these long bankruptcy cases, statements in the ultimate decision that seem to have a lot of concern with killing off a company and concern with preserving the jobs of a company above all else. So here's this article about Indian banks resorting to muscle men during the financial crisis because of not having a better enforcement mechanism judicially. So into all this steps the National Housing Bank. And we've seen the serious reasons that make securitization of mortgages attractive there. This is the first issue of mortgage-backed securities in 2000, which was bought you know, within a day, fully invested in. And it's still a small mortgage market at this point. Many people are not in houses, so we're not talking about a huge volume of mortgage-backed securities being created. But it, it is increasing. I have this graph going up to 2013, but I couldn't get it pasted into the slide. But the trend continues to go upwards, and here's, here's the numbers for those last years. And so I think the question is, I mean, we saw the rate of increase in the US, and we saw a lot of the incentives that make this an attractive form of funding. And so if this did get bigger, and if it did start to reach a systemic level. I mean, there are risks in these mortgages. I mean, they, they look like some of the ones that we have vilified here in the US. A lot of them have a, an opening low rate of interest that then jumps very high. A lot of them have been originated by these non-bank finance companies that are entirely outside of the regulatory system and are not regulated at all. Um, ratings agencies are on the same model that's been blamed here for the crisis. Banks, of course, are very different in India. And there is a lot of persistence of the, the state-owned economy in the way that banks behave and in requirements. And you know, there are lending priorities at Indian banks where a certain number of assets have to go in agricultural industries and things like that. So that might make the behavior of banks different from what we saw 
in the US. Um, they're also at this point largely engaged in traditional banking in a way that American investment banks weren't. But I guess the question is all of this is, are there pressures on those regulations? And will those regulations stay in place? Or could they slowly dissipate over time and not be as protective? So here are some cries for the lack of bankruptcy law in India. And so what I'm going to be trying to get to here is the argument that you need bankruptcy. And if you're going to be engaging in these financial products, which can be very helpful in development, you really need a bankruptcy as a backstop in your economy first. So why don't I stop there for some questions, and particularly if on the second half, because I haven't started on it, um, directions to go in, questions to ask. And then on the first half, if there were logical inconsistencies or holes in the reasoning, something that didn't convince you, something that would have been better in a different order, that would also be very helpful too. Yeah. So I would like to ask you, so with that India case, are you, going, are you proposing to um, just enforce and create the bankruptcy law in India, or you are also proposing, or I don't know if you're, these other adjustments that are proposed in the US, which is chapter 14 and title one, title two something, is that also you're proposing to embrace in India, like how you want to merge these two cases? I mean, you have the same situation with assets being outside of the bankruptcy system. So that's there already. But yes, this is a question. I mean, how much do I need to go into the types of resolution authorities that do exist there that have nothing to do with bankruptcy? Because there have been reactions to the crisis of creating a resolution authority there as here. And is that, is that necessary to go into, or is just the fact of not having a functioning bankruptcy system enough? So the question you ended the first section with, I think, let me see if I'm going to say it right, is um, that the bankruptcy system provides a good backstop. So, all, so in the US, if we just stop having these safe harbors, mm -hmm. um, we would have enough of a backstop. So here's my question, like my fear about mm -hmm. um, taking US systems in importing them or exporting them, whichever side you're on. Um, the, w I'd be interested in the question, what would an effective backstop system look like in India, which gives it a more, grounds it more in the context of their institutions and practices than... I agree entirely. How would you go about answering that? And what, what might it look like? To me, it's like an analysis of US and other systems about like the def definition of backstop. Mm. Like, what, is, what does backstop mean? And so for example, like one of my other questions about the first part, like you had this little thing in there, I think about the swaps, and that you wanted the, the party, counterparty, to be doing the investigation about the riskiness, which I thought was what the credit agencies did. And so, 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 there's a, so that makes me wonder, right, that the issue isn't being like credit agencies. You know, like why would you put that on poor Nicole to do um, that job? Because the whole point of the credit agencies was that you have this asymmetrical information, so I can't do it. Back to the story between uh, Sam was in a worse position than Rustin was when you were the law firm. And yet the solution was to go put the burden on the person without the basement. So, mm -hmm. so I think that, that one way to answer that is to like say, okay, this is a function, these are the pieces of our system, and this is the function that they're supposed to serve in the relationship. I think you have to do almost like a structural analysis of the relationship and what is, what is the thing that gets to transparency, fairness, and all the things that you care about, and then look about 
I think that it's more something like that. I mean, that's not a full sentence, but you're shaking your head. <laughs> no, I agree. I'm figuring out how to do that. I like the fact that you were choosing rating agencies as your example because that's one thing that is pretty well analogous between the two systems. I mean, to the extent that rating agencies have been blamed for the fact that the person who's issued the debt that's getting rated is paying for them and the incentives that that sets up to give a good rating and keep their business, the same payment structure is in India. Wait, but so what else is different? The counter -swap part, the counter party is not the right answer. I mean, I think that's not the right answer. Clearly, there's a problem there. So what would it look like? And the answer might be different in the US than it would be in India, but maybe it's the question is the same. So I think maybe that, okay, so I think maybe I'm getting closer to answering your question. I think you want to be asking the same sets of questions, but I don't want you to assume the same answer. So if the answer here, is, here in the US is, we've got a pretty decent um, bankruptcy system, your guy who now is in the business school, Thomas, <laughs> you know, he's basically saying tweak, they're important, but tweak them. That is it doesn't, it can't, does not follow that they have a strong bankruptcy system with the legal institutions that support it that we have with the same sets of relationships and structures. So I don't want you to assume that. I think that's where your weakness could, I think that's the weakness in, in that. I agree, and this is very helpful. And it could be, I mean, here's, I'm sort of, foreseeing having to get into the fact that, I mean, there's a pretty high number of banks that are still state-owned in, in India, which seems remarkably different if it's such a big deal for a partial nationalization to happen here. <laughs> but if you already own a lot of them, does it really matter if you own some more in the way that it seemed so scary here? Um, yeah. Is it possible to look at in the two contexts, like what are the institutions, processes, and values that lead to efficiency, fairness, and transparency in both contexts, and then maybe figure out like what are what are the differences and similarities that then might lead you to figure out okay, it's bank, it's Chapter Eleven bankruptcy law in the U.S. Something else in India, or could look like something else in India, or maybe it's something similar. Well, I'm going to open this up to you all. I mean, if you're listing out these things that could be the creators of efficiency, fairness, and transparency, and if we think the bankruptcy law is one of those, what, what other possibilities are there? What other variables might you look at? Yes, well, going back to the credit agent, or the rating agencies. I mean, we had a speaker earlier talking about the importance of reputation. Does reputation play a role in other parts of I mean, this problem? So, person. Well, that's interesting because what I understand is happening with mortgage writing in India is the securitization is really attractive because of there not being a way to enforce otherwise. But there are some runarounds to the inability to enforce so that, and I mean, these are essentially young professional lawyers, bankers who are entering mortgages in India right now who care about their reputation. And so what mortgage lenders have done is required them to write an entire stack of checks for the entire mortgage dated down the line <laughs> because to write a bad check is a crime and would be very embarrassing for this population. So that is using reputational bounds to get around the lack of bankruptcy system. Hmm. But is there like, uh, is there the uh, enforcement mechanism for, you know, legal system in India? Can they enforce those bankruptcy or whatever laws? efficiently, like a state, banks are owned by the state, so it's mm -hmm. kind of murky, you know? I mean, it is a, you know, a federalized system with judicial appointments, and that's all modeled on England, and is generally seen as 
as good. However, there is that judicial preference to just keep a company in bankruptcy forever because then it never has to die and it never has to stop employing people. And so there are these companies limping along because the judge wants that to be so, so this is an aspect of this, yeah. Um, so your presentation convinced me that the bankruptcy system in India could, if run well, could really improve efficiency. Um, is there a way for companies, I mean, assuming they're able to get enforcement from the government of voluntary agreements, is there a way to do something, like to opt out of the state bankruptcy system in a way analogous to how some companies agree to arbitration as opposed to, um, which would just sort of like a privately run legal system, uh, although the agreement to participate in arbitration is usually enforced by the government. Is there a way that they could do something like that and basically come up with their own bankruptcy system, a market bankruptcy system? I guess why would you do that if you could opt out by using securitization instead and not bear any risk of bankruptcy? But it seemed, it seemed like uh, your presentation was saying that people almost irrationally thought that the counterparties were less risky and basically overlooked the inherent risk of all these uh, repos and MBS exposures. So since that experience is relatively recent, you would think that this would be individually rational for people to participate in those kinds of agreements, at least when looking at it ex ante. I mean, it's in the, I'm trying to think of whose interest it's in. So it's not in the interests of creditors because they bear no bankruptcy risk by using the securitized process. It is in the interests of the country as a whole, we think. It is in the interests of- better, better, cheaper credit because they are, it's less risky because you know that you can deal with them in a more efficient bankruptcy court. I mean, securitization is cheaper for that reason. Um, it's interesting. I mean, the, the other problem I'm seeing is that there's very little bankruptcy arbitration, and I'm not sure why, but there just is not much of it. Maybe there should be. Um, hmm. So working around the limitations of a country's institutions by creating a separate system. Are you creating it from scratch so that you have an untested system that you will only test in crisis? Or are you modeling it off of other systems? If you're modeling it, does it relate to the realities? in the country that Roz is talking about. Mm -hmm. But you think regardless, it, it's more rational for an individual creditor and debtor to try to use securitization rather than... Because then there's no bankruptcy risk at all. Mm -hmm. But as you say, that's a short-term assessment and seeing the kinds of resolutions that we're turned to in the US, it's not a long-term way of thinking. And with that, as you said, recent, that might change that. So kind of, yeah. to, uh, to, no, I just want to kind of to wrap up and I wait for like five minutes. But so in that book, you also, oh, Michelle mentioned that you're writing a book or it will be part of a book. Tell us more about that project. Though. This is a totally separate project that I have not done any work on oh, since the spring. <laughs> This is um, a textbook on cross-border bankruptcy and law, and, but um, so it's related in a certain way. But indirectly. Oh, I was thinking um, one of the arguments we could look at for India is um, because the debt market is more popular there, so the leverage ratio must be higher than that in the U.S. because in the U.S. debt financing is more expensive than active financing. The stock market is much more advanced than India. So people have to, in India, go 
for debt financing more, so which will make the companies or banks like uh, leverage more. So higher debt means higher risk for bankruptcy. So do you think it's kind of one of the reasons why India has to go for a more strict bankruptcy law? Because the risk for default or bankruptcy is higher because you have a higher ratio of debt compared to your equity. This is an interesting way to look at it. And unfortunately, I didn't put up information about India's equity markets, which has also grown very quickly. And a lot of these efforts sort of catch the debt market up to it um, as a diversification means. So to, um, to the total assets is still less than that in the U.S. I know so we have the more, question. Yeah, we have more options in the U.S. for the company to finance itself. So they probably, usually they don't go for debt financing. It's much more expensive. And they don't want to get the, uh, expose themselves to a lot of debts because if you don't meet your debts, you have to go to bankruptcy. But in India, I would suspect the ratio is much lower. Well, this is definitely worth looking into. My fear is that the equity market is still so much bigger because I think a lot of the reaction to the Asian financial crisis was that those economies were too big on equities and didn't have debt markets as big as those in the US. And so that's been catching up, but I don't know. OK, I guess that's uh, oh, Ted, that last one question. One more thing to ask in the last couple of minutes, but people who are People who were against the bailouts in 2008 often say, <clears throat> well, they should have just, well, we should have let them all fail and let them go into bankruptcy, and that would have been that. But, you know, bank you said that the goals of bankruptcy should be e efficient, transparent, and fair, but there's nothing about speed in there. So meanwhile, the economy is grinding to a halt. Institutions are failing, and by putting them into bankruptcy, doesn't it will take so long you know, when the economy needs help right away. So in what ways has bankruptcy law tried to become faster, I guess, in light of 2008? Well, I suppose some of that is part three <laughs> that we didn't get to, which is, which is secured creditors unhappy with how much they're getting back, pushing, and this is in the US and then the second half is in the UK as well. Secured creditors taking control of this process and doing things to speed it up. In the US, that's finding this little bit of the bankruptcy code that no one really knows what it means and there isn't much to hint at what it means and to put companies through these fast asset sales and courts have reacted by being very open to doing that. And in the UK, it's been by secured creditors basically coming up with a plan before they even put the company into bankruptcy. And then because of the powers that they have in bankruptcy, that's the plan. There's no further voting or negotiating that happens. Like there's a trade-off between speed and then the other three, efficiency, and transparency, and fairness. You go faster, things aren't going to be negotiated as precisely. I so. think so, personally, and I don't really see this as a good thing. OK, I think we should wrap up. Unfortunately, we have more questions, but uh, thank you so much. Uh,